Hey there! In this lecture, you're going to learn how to create your very first Flexbox layout using the example you can see on the page here. I've already added a little bit of styling in the basic.css file, though this has nothing to do with the Flexbox itself. Here in the index.html, you can see the markup for the example. It contains a nav element with the class of container, and inside of that container, we have three divs, which are the flex items. As you might guess, we're going to create a navbar here, as this displays home, search, and logout. Now, the first thing you need to understand is the concept of a container and its items, as that's always how you build up your Flexbox layout. They don't have to be divs or navs. It could have been UL element, and this could be list elements, or whatever you want. As long as they are direct children of the Flexbox container, they turn into flex items. So let's turn this example here into a Flexbox layout. I'm going to head over to the index.css and I've already given the container a border, which you can see around the example here. But as we haven't done anything else with this layout, these divs will now just stack themselves on top of each other. So to turn this into a Flexbox layout, I'll simply give the container a display of flex. As you can see, it automatically lines up the elements horizontally as opposed to vertically as it was before. So by default, Flexbox will distribute the items going from left to right. And as you also can see, the Flexbox container is by default a block element, as it takes up all available space in the width, except for the little margin I've added to the left and right hand side. Okay, so that was a very quick introduction to Flexbox. In the next lecture, I'm going to teach you about the concept of access, as that is core in order to understand Flexbox properly. So I'll see you there. Hey, in this lecture, I'm going to teach you about access, as that is a core concept you need to understand in order to work properly with Flexbox. Because a Flexbox container always has a direction. And by default, this direction is horizontal, as that's how it lays out its items, starting here on the left-hand side and going towards the right-hand side. What we then say is that our main axis goes from left to right along the row. And we also have a cross axis, which goes from top to bottom. Now, the reason you need to understand this is that we're using different CSS properties in order to position our content along the main axis, which goes horizontally in this case, and the cross axis, which goes vertically in this case. However, that's not always the case, as we can also flip the direction of the Flexbox container. Let's do that. We'll head over to the container and give it a flex direction. By default, this one is set to row. So if we write row, nothing will happen. However, if we change this to column, now as you can see, that results in stacking the items from top to bottom, going downwards instead of going from left to right. And now the main axis actually goes from top to bottom, and the cross axis goes from left to right. Now we're going to flip this back to row, as I've found that I've used the default direction much more often than the column direction when building websites. So I want to focus on that in this course, as I want it to be as practical as possible. But I want you to be aware that the main axis is horizontal because the flex direction is set to row. However, it can be vertical as well. Okay, in the next lecture, I'm going to teach you how to position items along the main axis. So stay tuned and I'll see you there. Hey there, in this lecture, I'm going to teach you how to position the items along the main axis, which goes, as you hopefully remember, from left to right. And that's because we probably don't want all of our items to be squeezed together over here at the left hand side. Because we might, for example, want a little bit of spacing in between them, or maybe move the logout item over to the right hand side. So let's jump into the code and see how we can achieve this. We're going to use the property called justify content, as that's the one which controls the content along the main axis. Justify content can take a range of different values, and I actually want to paste in a few of them here for you to experiment with towards the end of this lecture. By default, justify content is set to flex start, meaning that the content is squeezed together at the start of the main axis, which is the left hand side. If we change it to flex end, and as you can see, the content will move over to the end of the main axis on the right hand side. We can also use 
center and that will of course center it now it also has a few other nice properties which start with space let's try this space round this value will give each item an equal amount of space on its left hand side and right hand side because as you can see when two items are beside each other the space is twice as wide as if as if it's only an item and then the start of the container or the end of the container because this space here is twice as wide as this space here and this space here so what i want you to do now is try out these last two values for yourself space between and space evenly so pause the screen cost and change this value here to these two and observe how the items are laid out in the main direction and try to understand how these three space between space evenly and space around differ from each other once you've done that just resume back to the screen cost and then we'll continue with the course okay so hopefully you have been doing a little bit of experimentations if you have any questions feel free to ask them in the q a section and in the next lecture you're going to learn even more about how to position items along the main axis so i'll see you there Hey, in this lecture, I'm going to explain how you can adjust the position of single items along the main axis using the good old technique of margin auto. Because these various justify content values are nice and handy, but they don't always do what you want them to do. For example, I might not want to have the items spread around the container like this. Perhaps I want the home and search over on the left hand side and the logout over on the right hand side. And that's not something you can do with any of the justify content values alone. So let's actually remove justify content so that they're all squeezed together on the left hand side as that's the default layout. Now what I want to do is move the logout item over to the right hand side. And as that forces us to target that item itself, I've given all three items class names, home, search and logout. So to change the logout item, we'll simply target it and give it a margin on the left hand side and set that to auto and as you can see that pushes the logout item all the way over to the right hand side and this space here now is the margin left of the logout item so this is normally how i position single items along the main axis if we wanted to have both the logout and the search item over on the right hand side we could simply target the search item instead so if I remove it from logout, it'll be placed in the default layout. And then I'll simply give the search a margin on the left side instead. And as the search is before the logout in the markup, it'll push the logout as well to the right hand side when it adds a margin to its own left hand side. Now I want to give you a little task. First, I'm going to remove this one here and I'm going to set the justify content to flex end, pushing all the items over to the right hand side. What I want you to do now is to make the home item rather appear here on the left hand side. I want you to do it by adding a margin to the home item. So go ahead and do that. Then just resume and come back to the screen cost when you've managed to do it. And then I will show you the solution as well. Okay, so hopefully you pause the screen cost and write that out. What you need to do is to give this home item margin on its right hand side. So we'll do margin right and set that to auto and boom, that pushes the home item from this space here to this space here. And this is now the margin. Okay, that was it for this lecture. In the next one, you're going to learn a really cool property called Flex, which allows you to have responsive width on the items themselves. So I'll see you there. Hey, in this lecture, you're going to learn about the Flex property, which allows you to set the width of the items according to the width of the entire container, meaning that they will become responsive. That unlike our current items, which stay the same regardless of the width of the container. So if we want all of these items to stretch across the entire container and grow and shrink with it, we'll simply target the items with dot container, select all the direct children, which also are divs, and then give them a flex property of 
one. And as you can see, they now take up an equal amount of space, a third each, and they grow and shrink with the size of the container. Now, there's a little bit of magic here, as flex is actually a shorthand for three other properties. They are flex grow, flex shrink, and flex basis. However, I don't want to dwell about this now, because I think there are other parts of Flexbox that are more important to learn before you jump into understanding these three. So we'll start by using Flex the easy way, and then in a later screencast, I'll explain these three in depth. But for now, I'll just keep them here to remind you that this is a shorthand. Now, setting Flex to 1 is much better than the old way of doing it, where you'd probably set the width to a percentage, like this example still works however now you have to change this number whenever you wanted to add a new item in the container whereas with flex you can simply add as many items as you want and flexbox will take care of doing the maths for you and making all of them responsive so let's actually try that out we'll turn on the flex again and let's simply add a fourth item here We'll call it profile. Let's run the code. And as you can see, Flex automatically allocates space for all of the items according to how we've specified it here. Now each of them take up 25% of the width and they grow and shrink with the container. We can also target specific items. Let's say that for example, we want the search item here to be twice as wide as the rest of the items. Then we'll simply do container search and set flex to two. And as you can see, it's now twice as wide as the three other items. The reason I'm specifying container and then the child of that container, which I have the class of search, is because doing just dot search wouldn't work, as this selector here is more specific than this one. And that's how CSS works works if this one is more specific given that it has both a class name and tag name its styling will be prioritized above the less specific styling added here so that's only using just a class name so let's use both dot container and the child of the container as the class of search so that was just a little digression about css selectors so while this example here is nice for learning, I can say that I very often use this way of creating layouts where all of the items are one and then some of them are two or three or whatever. What I've found to be a more realistic use case is to have one of the items doing all the flexing while the others stay at a fixed width. And we can achieve that by simply removing the flex one on all the items except the search. Now, as you can see, the home logout and profile have a fixed width, while the search item is growing and shrinking with the width of the container. And now we can also remove the specification here and just use dot .search. Okay, now I want to give you a little task. And before that, I'm going to remove this profile item so that we only have three. Now, as you can see, the search in the middle does all the flexing while the home and logout are fixed width. What I want you to do now is to make this layout do the exact opposite, meaning that the search item will have a fixed width while the home and the logout will grow as you widen the container. So pause the screencast and do that. And when you come back, I'm going to show you how I would do it. Okay, so hopefully you paused the screencast and did the task. Now I'm gonna show you how I would do it. So I'll start by making the search item fixed width again. To do that, I can just remove this one here now it's fixed width, and rather give this value to the home item. Now that is doing all the flexing. And what I also want to do now is to change this to one, because when this is the only item doing the flexing, it doesn't matter if this is one or two or a hundred or a thousand or whatever you want. And therefore, I think it's easiest to just have it as one. Now we also have to give the same behavior to the logout item. So I'll simply do logout, and just as that, we have both the home and the logout item growing and shrinking, while the search has a fixed width. Now, I really don't know why you would create a layout like this, but this is at least how you would do it. And that is it for this lecture. I'll see you in the next one.
Hey, now that you know quite a bit about how to control the items along the main axis using stuff like justify content, margins, and flex, I want to teach you how to control the content along the cross axis, which in our case goes from top to bottom. And by default, the items stretch themselves across the cross axis. To make this a little bit more apparent, let's set the height of the container here to 100%. Now, as you can see, they stretch across the axis going from top to bottom, regardless of how tall it is. Now, a quick note on this height 100%. This only works because we've set the height of the HTML and the body to 100%. If we hadn't done that, then the height of the HTML and the body would just be whatever the container forces it to be, meaning whatever height the container needs in order to display its content, and thereby setting the height to 100% wouldn't have any effect at all. I could just remove it, it doesn't do anything. So this is a nice technique for having the container responsive in the height as well. Setting the HTML and the body to 100% and the container as well. Okay, so by default, align items is set to stretch. So this align items here is the property that controls the items in the cross axis. If we change it to, for example, flex start, as you can see, then they're pushed all the way to the top, the start of the cross axis, and they only take up as much space in the height as they need in order to display their content. We can also do flex end, that'll push them downwards to the end of the axis. And of course, you can also do center, that'll center it. Now, as a little side note here, I want to point out that Flexbox is great for centering an item inside of a container. For example, let's say that we only had one item here. It could be a button with the X inside of it, like this, for example. Then we could easily center this inside of the container using align items and combining it with justify content and doing center there as well. Now, as you can see, the button is centered no matter how you change the container. So that's a nice little trick, which I've found often comes in handy when building various layouts. Okay, so let's change this back again. Like that and remove this one. Because finally, I want to show you how to align a single item at a time. Let's, for example, target the logout item. We can then do align self and set that, for example, to flex start. That'll push just that item to the top of the axis. Now, what I want you to do is to make this home item appear all the way at the bottom here. So go ahead and pause the screencast, jump into the code and make that happen. And when you've done it, Come back and I'll show you how to do it as well. Okay, so hopefully you managed to do that. Let's look at how I would do it. We're going to first target the home item and we're going to give it a line self and set that to flex end. Because the end of the cross axis is all the way here at the bottom. And now we have this really weird layout, kind of a diagonal nav bar which also works responsively in a very weird way. So I have no idea how you want layout like this. You've at least learned how to do it using align self and align items. And that was it. I'll see you in the next screencast. Hey, in this lecture, we're going to talk about flex direction column, because up until now, we've used the default way of laying out items, which is flex direction row meaning that the flex container lays out items along the row, going from left to right. So now let's try flex direction column. As you can see, that changes the container so that it lays out the items going from top to bottom. And this again means that justify content no longer controls how the items are stacked across the horizontal line but rather how they're stacked across the vertical line. And that's because the main axis now is vertical, going from top to bottom, and not horizontal, going from left to right, 
which it was when we had flex direction rho, like that. Okay. So let's try and add justify content and set it to, for example, flex end. And that doesn't result in any change actually. So why is that? Well, it's because the height of the container is not set explicitly. It's just as tall as the content inside of it forces it to be, meaning that it has no extra space when it's trying to push all the content towards the flex end, which is the bottom of the container. So what we have to do is explicitly set the height of the container to 100%. And there you can see, now the container takes up the entire window, or almost at least, and the justify content pushes all the content down to the bottom of the main axis. Now, just as a reminder, when using this height 100%, you also have to set the height of the HTML and the body to 100%. Here. Okay. If we change the flex end to flex start, all the content will just be on top here. And that's also the default way of doing it, as you can see. We can also do center, and that will center it. Okay, let's now look at align items, which controls the layout in the cross axis, which now is horizontal, going from left to right. If we want to shove the items over to the right hand side, for example, we can do align items and do flex end. That'll push the item towards the end of the cross axis. As you might remember, by default, it's set to stretch, set to stretch. So they stretch themselves all the way from the start of the axis to the end of the axis. Let's also try flex start. And of course, we can do center. Now, I want to give you a little task. I want you to make the content appear in the bottom right corner here. So go ahead and pause the screencast, do that, and when you come back, I'll show you the solution as well. Okay, so hopefully you paused the screencast and completed the task. Let's look at the solution. We want this chunk of items here to appear down in the bottom right corner. And let's first push it all the way over to the right. Then we'll need to target the cross axis, the align items, and change that to flex end as this is the end of the cross axis, the horizontal one. Now we also need to place it in the end of the main axis, which now goes from top to bottom, meaning that we'll also set justify content to flex end. And there you go. In the next lecture, we're going to look at wrapping. So stay tuned and I'll see you there. Hey, in this lecture, you're going to learn how to wrap items in Flexbox. So here we have our standard nav bar. It contains three items and each of them are just as wide as the content inside of them forced them to be. What I want to do now is target each of the items, give them width of 300 pixels. As you can see, they now fill the entire width of the container. However, they're clearly not 300 pixels wide each. They're scaled downwards as the container is less than 900 pixels wide in total. However, if we widen it, here, as you can see, they become 300 pixels wide when the container is wide enough. So what happens here is that Flexbox won't allow you to set the width explicitly if there's not enough within the container itself to fill that content it'll automatically scale it down. And by default, it won't allow you to, for example, push any of the items down to the next row. And that's because Flexbox has a flex wrap property set to no wrap by default. It doesn't allow wrapping, meaning you can only have one row or one column along your given main axis. But if we change this to app instead, you can see that it now allows you to wrap the content because you have the home here, the search here, and when it tries to fit in the logout, it doesn't have enough room to add the item. So it wraps and puts it on the next line, the next row. And if we shrink the container even more, it'll wrap so that there's only one item in each row. 
Now the total width of the container is less than 600 pixels, meaning it can only fit one 300 pixel item on each row. However, if it has enough room, it fills up with as many items as it can on each row. Okay, so that was a quick intro to FlexWrap. I'll see you in the next lecture. Hey there, in this lecture, we're going to take a deep dive into the flex property, which we talked about in a previous lesson. So now I have a very simple version of our navbar. This time it only contains two items, the home item and the logout item, and they both have a flex of one. That means that they'll take up half the space each and they'll grow and shrink with the size of the container. However, as I mentioned earlier, flex is actually a shorthand property for three other properties. They are called flex grow, flex shrink, and flex basis. And setting flex equal to one, and when we set the flex value, we're actually setting all three of these. And even just writing one is actually also kind of a shorthand, because what we're actually saying here is one, one, zero. The first number is the grow value, the second is the shrink value, and the third is the basis value. So this is also the same as setting one, one, zero. So it's kind of three levels here. You can write it the hard way, doing it like this, or the slightly easier way, doing it like this, or the absolutely easiest way, doing it like this. Okay, this might seem confusing, so let's actually go through these properties here one by one. I'll remove this one and also comment out the flex grow and flex shrink. Now copy that over here. Now what we're going to do is set the flex basis on both of the items. We'll set it to 200 pixels and set it to that on both. Now, we have a container with two items, which each are set to 200 pixels. At least they'll be 200 pixels if the container is more than 400 pixels wide. So, flex basis is a way of setting the base width of the element. So, they'll now stay at 200 pixels, regardless of how much extra space there is in the container. If there's less than 400 pixels, they'll actually start to shrink, but that's something we're going to look at a little bit later, so let's not get ahead of ourselves there. Let's move on to the flex grow. If we cut this out here and paste it in there and do the same thing here, now you can see they actually grow with the width of the container. So flex grow basically decides how much of the extra space should be distributed to the various items. If we set them to zero on both of these, this extra space will not be distributed to either home or logout since they both have a flex grow of zero. However, if for example logout gets a flex grow of one, it'll take up all of the remaining space and home will get nothing of the remaining space. But as you saw, if the home also has value of one, it too will grow with the size of the container. And now as these values are identical, both have one, the flexbox layout will distribute the extra space evenly across the two items. So these two numbers also work in relation to each other. If we set logout to two, you'll see that the logout grows twice as quick as the home. This will be a bit more apparent if we use a larger number, for example, five. Now when it grows, you can see that the logout is clearly growing faster than the home item. And actually it's growing five times faster. So just to reiterate on that, if we set both of these to zero, then we have the extra space on the side and the wider we make the container, the more extra space we have. However, if we give the logout flex grow of one, it will take up all of the available space and grow into it. We make only the home have a flex grow of one, it will take up all the available space, and grow into it. And if both of them are set to one, they will distribute the extra space evenly across each other. Okay, so now let's move on to flex shrink. Let's set these flex grow values back to zero and copy the shrink down here and down here. So as you remember, even though 
we've set the basis here to 200 pixels. The flex container will force them to be less than 200 pixels if the container is less than 400 pixels, like now. Now there may be 150 pixels each or something like that. And that is because flex shrink is set to one, meaning that they will both shrink at an equal rate. And this is actually the default value for flex shrink. So while the grow is by default set to zero, the flex shrink is by default set to one, meaning that if I remove this one and this one, we'll still have the same behavior. They both shrink at an equal rate. Let's get them back again. Okay, now let's change the flex shrink to zero for the home item. What'll happen now is that when we reach the 400 pixel threshold and the items will have to start shrinking, the logout will do all the shrinking while the home stays at 200 pixels. So the logout is doing all the shrinking since it has flex shrink set to one, while home does none of the shrinking since it has flex shrink set to zero. Now let's change the flex shrink on this one to something greater than one and see what happens then. Let's add five for example. What happens now is that when we reach the threshold, the home item is shrinking much quicker than the logout item. It's actually shrinking five times faster than the logout item. So these numbers work in relation to each other, meaning that you have to look at both the numbers, this one and this one, to understand how one of the numbers play out on the page. Because now logout has a flex shrink of one, and as you can see, it shrinks really slowly because one is a small number in relation to five. However, if we take this back again and set the flex shrink of home to zero, then suddenly logout does all the shrinking because one in relation to zero is infinitely more. Okay, so let's rewrite these two here to the behavior we want. We want flex grow actually to be at one and we want flex shrink to be at one and do the same thing here and have the flex basis stay at 200. So now they grow and shrink at the same rate and they have, and they are 200 pixels by default. So now we can get back to the shorthand again. We're going to do flex and do one, one, 200 pixels. This is the exact same thing as this, meaning we can remove this and also copy it over to this logout item. Okay, so finally, I want to give you the task for this lecture. What I want you to do now is that once this container here crosses the threshold of 400 pixels, I want you to make the logout item grow 10 times as fast as the home item. So go ahead and do that. And when you come back to the screencast, I'll show you the solution. Okay, hopefully you paused the screencast and did the assignment. It's really easy, actually. If you want the logout to grow 10 times as fast as the home item, you simply set the flex grow, which is the first one of the three, to 10. And now, as you can see, the logout grows really fast and home grows really slowly. However, when they start shrinking, they both shrink at an equal rate, meaning when they're less than 200 pixels, they both shrink and grow, actually, at the same rate. But once they cr cross the 200 pixel threshold, about here, the logout takes over. Okay, so that was it, and I'll see you in the next lecture. Hey there, really nice thing about Flexbox is that it has so-called source order independence, meaning that you can move around on the items regardless of how they're laid out in the markup. And an example of this is the order property. So let's see how it works. We have the three items, home, search, and logout in the container here. And I've given them number as that simply makes it easier to follow what's going on here. I've also given them classes of item one, item two, and item three. Let's head over to the CSS and give the item two, for example, order property one. And what happened here is that the search jumped over to the third spot where the logout used to be. And I've not changed anything in the HTML. The source order is still one, two, three, but the order on the page is one, three, two. 
And you might be a little bit confused about why setting the value to one results in it being placed all the way at the end. And that is because by default, the order is set to zero. So whatever items that have an order above zero, for example, one will be placed at the end. However, if we give it a value below zero, for example, minus one, it'll be placed in the beginning. So let's also add a selector for item one and item three. And by default, they're all set to zero. So if we set them to zero, that won't result in anything. If we want the first item to, for example, appear at the last spot, we can give it a value above zero. For example, five or four or three or two. Doesn't matter. It'll stay at the end of the main axis as long as its order is above the order of the rest of the items. So what I want you to do now is to make these three items appear in the opposite direction of how they're originally laid out, meaning it's three to one instead of one to three. And I want you to do that using both positive and negative numbers in the order here. So go ahead and do that now. And when you come back, I'll show you how to do it as well. Okay, so hopefully you completed that task. Let's now do it ourselves. So the second item here will stay at the same place. That's the first and the third, which will basically be swapped. And we're going to use positive and negative numbers. So I'll start with targeting the third item, the logout one, and set this to minus one. Now that's first. And then we have to set the item one, the home, to a positive number, one. And now that is laid out towards the end, three, two, one. And that was it. I hope you managed to do this as well. And congratulations, you've completed the main section of this Flexbox course. So give yourself a pat on the back. And if you have any questions, feel free to ask that in the Q&A section and, uh, and I'll answer it as soon as possible. Thank you. Hey, in this bonus lecture, you're going to learn how to create a fully responsive nav bar, which adapts itself to various screen sizes using a bunch of the concepts you've learned so far including flex grow, flex shrink, flex basis, flex wrap, and the order property. So here is our nav bar. It has four items, and it's only the search item, which is flexing. As you can see, it grows and shrinks with the size of the container. And that's because we've given the search item a flex value of one, while the others are only as wide as the content inside of them force them to be. I've also added a bit different styling to this example. As you can see, we're only using one background color as that looks a little bit nicer. And the reason we used different background colors in previous examples was because it was a bit more pedagogical. However, by now you should know the basics of how Flexbox works, so we don't need different colors. In the HTML, you'll also see a few changes. As the container, we're using an unordered list and list items as the flex items as this is a little bit more semantically correct for creating a nav bar. The search item can be found here. And as you can see, I've added an input field so that you can actually write inside this search field. So nothing happens if you try searching for anything. Now, this nav bar works well on wide screens and it works well to right about here where it starts breaking because the search suddenly can't fit anymore. So what we want to do here is actually allow the container to wrap and to place two items instead of four on each of the two rows. So let's do that. We'll head over to the index.css and we'll simply create a media query. Set it to 600 pixels. And inside of it, target the container and allow it to wrap because right now, it won't wrap. Regardless of how narrow you make it, it simply will not allow you to add items on multiple rows. It'll only allow one row. To change that, we'll do flex wrap and set it to wrap. As you can see, now it'll allow wrapping. Here, the logout wrap down to the second row. So this doesn't look very nice. Let's go back here and we'll target the 
items. Add, and set their flex value to flex grow one, flex shrink one, however, flex basis 50%, because that'll make each row fit two items like that. And as you can see, we have home and profile in the first row and search and log out on the second row, each taking up 50% of the total width. Now I actually want to align the search placeholder text in the center instead of at the left hand side. So I'll do search input and do align. So that looks a bit better. This has nothing to do with the flex box itself. It's just a design choice. Okay, so now we have two different states, this one and this one, and it's actually pretty nice. However, if the screen becomes even narrower, look what will happen. It'll actually break at this point, pushing the search and the logout onto a row each. However, home and profile can still fit on one row, so Flexbox will allow them to stay on the same row. When it reaches this point, each item is a single row each. So I don't want this middle stage here. This one, the vertical layout, is good for very narrow screens, mobile phones, for example. And this one is good for a bit wider screens, but this layout isn't really that useful. So let's rather control this by creating another media query. This time, simply copy it from here and we'll add it at 400, for example. And what we need to do now is at this point, target each of the items like we're doing here. However, instead of giving each item 50% of the row in the width, we'll give them 100%. So I'll just copy this actually and change this to 100%. As you can see, now the breakpoint at 400 pixels, which you reach here, gives us a clean transition from this state to this state. Now, finally, what I want to do is move the search all the way to the bottom, because I think it makes sense to have the search at the bottom when the layout is fully vertical. To do that, we'll target the search and simply give it an order of one, and it jumped down to the bottom. And remember, that's because by default, order is set to zero for all these items. And whatever item which has an order above the others, for example, this one has one which is above zero, will appear after the others. So that was it. I hope you learned something. Feel free to play around with this and change it however you want. And if you have any questions, just leave them in the Q&A section. Thank you. Hey, and welcome to this bonus lecture where we are simply going to experiment a little bit with an image grid in Flexbox. If you've seen my CSS grid course, you'll probably recognize this grid as I've simply cloned one of the screen costs there and changed around things a little bit. And I actually do recommend you to create image grids in CSS grid as that is made for two dimensional layouts while Flexbox is mainly one dimensional. However, you can recreate quite a lot of cool grids in Flexbox as well. So let's just jump into it and play around with it a little bit. Here we have our images. They can also be found in the IMG folder over here. We have the basic setup here. The container just has a display of flex. And as you can see that just lines up the images after each other and there are a bunch of them and they're way out of the Flexbox container because Flexbox won't allow you to wrap any of the items. It'll force everything to be on the same line. So let's first actually scale these images down a little bit. Let's give them a width of um, say 150 pixels and a height of 100 pixels. Now that'll change their aspect ratio a little bit, but let's not care about that because it looks kind of nice. Okay, um, now we want the images to wrap, of course. And as you remember, to do that, we, we do flex wrap and which by default is no wrap. And we're just going to remove the no and boom. There you can see now it wraps to a nice little image grid. However, as you can see at this point, they're skewed over to the left hand side. So one thing we can do to make it a little bit nicer is to do justify content and set that to center. That'll center it. Looks pretty decent. We can also try these around, for example. 
that'll add some space around the images. Though here you can see the problem. When Flexbox only can fill three items on the last row, the space around the images will be different than these, of course, resulting in this funny looking grid-ish layout here, but with a different type of grid down here. There's not an easy way to have these three images over at the left-hand side, for example, so that only the last spot here will be open. When you do space around, it'll do space around on each of the rows separately. If we did X start, we wouldn't center it like it did previously. Now we have much more space here and here, even though we have this more grid-ish layout. Okay, so what if we want these images here to be flexible in their width? Now we've just hard-coded their width and height, though what we can do instead is actually use percentages here. Let's do 100% and 100%, and we'll also do object fit cover. Move this justify content, and now it looks really broken. Just hang on a minute. What we'll also do is we'll target the items themselves, and we'll give them a flex value of flex grow one, flex shrink one, and a base width, for example, 150 pixels, which we previously had. Now you can see they scale up and down and also shuffle around when needed. So here they're base width 150 pixels, but they're allowed to grow and shrink. And the images themselves just take up whatever space each of the flex item has got available. And with the object fit cover, they take up all the width and all the height and cover the entire window. And that'll result in you not seeing all of the images in a given time. So if that's important, this is not a good solution. However, if you just want most of the images to appear in the box, don't care if it's cropped a little bit, this is actually a pretty nice solution. So however, Xbox lays out as many items as it can on each of the rows, doesn't evenly distribute it throughout rows. So when it gets to this point where we have 10 images here and our 11th image, which is the last one, down here, it'll be placed on a single row, meaning it'll be five times as wide as the others which isn't optimal. However, at these widths, it looks pretty nice. Now, we also have some big images here. I've given them class names of big here. And what I want to try out is actually do container and then target those big ones. And here I'll actually target the normal ones specifically as I've given them classes of normal as you can see here and now they're the same however if we give the big ones 250 pixels in base width you can see that that works as well it scales up and down however now we've said that we want the big images to start at 250 pixels width and the normal images to start at 150 pixels width and they are both to grow the container has room for it meaning you have this pretty cool looking grid okay feel free to play around with this perhaps adjust the values here you can drag and drop some more images in here, maybe some vertical and horizontal images and try to adjust their flex bases. Basically do whatever you want. So that was it. I hope you learned something. Thank you.